Okay, uh, we have the Q&A session now, and as Harry explained, uh, that'll be followed by the uh, second of Clive Richard's um, recorded uh, uh, lectures in due course. Uh, we are somewhat ahead of time, and so essentially this Q&A session can be extended as far as people uh, wish. Uh, you can ask a question specific to a particular presenter or specific to a particular topic, and then one or one or more of us will uh, try to offer an answer. Anyway, sir. Uh, just hang on, we'll get you a microphone. Uh, it's been a really interesting day. Thanks. Uh, it's been. I've, I've also I've, I've quite enjoyed going into the into the into the what ifs. But uh, but the other thing, other one I'm I'm actually interested in would be, would be interested to have the panel's views is is Harold Wilson only came in in 1964 narrowly. So I'm interested to have the panel's views is leaving aside whether the TSR two should have been built. Would a returned Conservative government, be it under Alec Douglas Hume or R. A. Butler or whoever? Do you think they would have continued with it? I think that's probably best answered by Keith. Um, yeah, we, this is where you get into the you know the boring bit of economics, and I think broadly speaking, uh, TSR two was going to run out of steam. Um, the costs were getting really out of control. I, I, I did jot down before, before I came here. I think we were already dealing with a, a, an estimated development cost in a, of about a quarter of a billion. This was in 1964-65. So you can see that, that there would have been, and there were, I've, I've seen a couple of the files in the Treasury, that of more than a touch of head scratching about the affordability of this product. And really when there was no immediate, no emerging market other than the 138 or so that the REF theoretically had on order, uh, I think you were looking at a product, a project that was going to be dead in the water by 1966. Um, the, 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 the programme that um, the Labour, part, Labour government inherited in 64 was totally unaffordable, uh, with P1154, HS681, oh, and you, let's not even mention the Concorde, which was in a sense being carried as a military procurement exercise, not as a conventional civil programme. The affordability of the British aerospace industry would have been under extreme pressure by 66 65, 66, and the, we forget to mention, 67, we devalued the pound. Uh, and the, the, the economic crisis that we that hit us then, I mean, that post-dates um, post TSR2, but it really is what killed the F-111 and the carrier force. Um, the total unsustainability of the British defence budget, of which TSR2 had been a star, had, played, had a starring role. So I think it, was, it would have been dead in the water in 65, 66. Anybody else? Yeah, can I, can I sure. yeah, thank you, Keith. Yeah, I, am I right in saying I think Douglas Hume was Prime Minister for just about a year? Yeah. yeah. I'm, this is off the top of my head. I'm sure I've read a document in the National Archives when Douglas Hume became Prime Minister and it was simply said, do we need this aircraft? So he was looking at whether we really need it at that stage. That was 1963. So I think they had doubts even by then. So I, I would suggest that back to so what Keith is saying. Um, just to sort of add to it, I think one of the issues is we'd look at costs as development costs. What was striking when I stumbled across some TSR, I guess having not, never done any research, but I was looking at the cost of other aircraft, um, was that the development costs were greater than you see in production costs. So for companies like English Electric, where production was where you made your money, actually it was a very skewed programme. You don't make great big profits in development, you make them in production. So for the company, it wasn't so attractive. And for the RAF, the maintenance man hours predicted for the, for the um, TSR2 was 80 versus 35 for the F111. Each TSR2 is expected to have 50 ground crew uh, a V bomber, you require 35, and you had national service was gone, so the size of the RF was reducing, so the burden was increasing. So I think on several counts, it would have run into problems, um, and perhaps the most. Um, I'll try to be humorous about this, but the noise Ivan t told me about how the TSR2, the uh, engine noise, was about 100, between 145 and 150 decibels, and that's the point at which your intestines start vibrating and you can have an un, a bad accident. So 50 ground crew having bad accidents, could, maybe the laundry bills would have bankrupted. But um, it, it, it was becoming an ever greater beast. And I think the Conservatives didn't cancel it before the election because there was an election and they wanted to get elected in, in Preston. It's as simple as that. Mm. 
Uh, well, the engine change would take uh, at least 24 hours, and I think the engines ended up being handed, so the left one would only fit in the left-hand side, the right one on the right-hand side, so they weren't interchangeable. So it was the costs, implications, life cycle costs of TSR2 were growing and growing. And the American, the F-111, even when it turned out to be worse than predicted, um, probably wasn't as bad as TSR2 would have been. And the Americans cancelled their procurement of F-111s partly because of the, the, the maintenance costs. So, um, yeah, it's I can't see how it would have survived. Thank you very much. Well, I think like all the audience I've found today very stimulating and incredibly informative. Um, one can speculate on what might have happened, um, but I'd like to ask the panel what should have happened. If you were uh, appointed a, a SPAD, Special Advisor to the Wilson government coming in, uh, in the interests of uh, national security, uh, the state of the economy, preserving British industry, what should we have done? I'm the first to be executed, am I? Right. Um, <laughs> Gosh, George, that's a difficult one to answer, actually, when I sort of deal with hardware. But I, I, I would say cancel it. And then um, I think, actually, what happened was as good as could have happened because um, we mentioned briefly the 1154 being cancelled, which was to spin in the supersonic Harrier. I spoke to John Fossard, who was the head designer on that, not long before he died, and he said getting the RAF to take vertical takeoff on its own was difficult enough. So adding reheat, whatever it was, would have made it really difficult. And I think I'm right in saying the 681 was actually quite a way down the road in terms of development and getting the... the well, was it the Hercules, I think, took its place, was a pretty straightforward decision. Um, I would suggest probably what happened was about the best. It could be done with Tornado and that following afterwards, because I think Tornado was a great success. Whether these gentlemen agree, I'll see. I'm second to die. Um, <laughs> I think it's a hard one to say. You're putting yourself when you're doing historical research, you have to put yourself into the mindset of the people back then. And I grew up in the Cold War. There's a Cold War exhibit out there, and for the, for a long time, we thought the Cold War was silly nonsense that's in the past. TSR2 had one job: nuke the Russians. Basically, that's the original requirement. Certainly, by the time it was going to be deployed, that was probably changing more east of Suez type stuff, sec uh, secondary wars. But when they wrote that requirement for doing that job, it probably is what you want. I mean, it was designed to, again, the maintenance demands were huge because the idea was you'd only use it for quite a short period of time when, when it really happened. Um, so if equipment failed, they'd have multiple things on board to fail so you could achieve that mission and maybe fly two or three sorties and it's over. Um, that, so I think we can be critical of the decision makers of the past because we don't recognise the problems. Of course, the last few months, the last year or so, sometimes you, we're in a bunker today and there's an element of has it all kicked off since we've been in here you know we're back in that world where russian nuclear weapons are a concern so i think should it what should have happened depends on the threat ultimately you look at the operational analysis they were very 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 concerned about that real threat and it's only at the point at which you think does that threat count anymore that maybe they should have done something and certainly from a nato perspective that's in 1968 when they moved to flexible response so I don't think it should have been cancelled if you took, take that threat seriously um, until the threat changed. Um, if, if you believe that is the only thing that meets that need, you suck up the costs if that's the war winner that you really want. Um, I think that's the part that's lost. I've spent probably a little bit, I've only done a few years of operational analysis. There are other people in the room who've done a lot more. But I think it's understanding the the thinking behind it that's often the real challenge because it's really easy to criticise oh, your, your, your aeroplane's rubbish as opposed to actually it's meeting a really hard challenge. Uh, I'm, I think I'm, a, I'm probably going to offend Derby shortly but uh, bear with me for a minute. I think there's a huge difference between 64 and 1967 um, both economically and strategically. 64, I think the Labour, Labour government got it right more right than I thought they had when I first looked at it. Uh, I, I, for one, for example, was thought they shouldn't have cancelled the P1154, but I, I've changed my mind about that over the years. So, in a sense, uh, the three big casualties of the, of, of, of the first 
1960s defence review, I think, were well chosen. The perspective of 67 becomes rather different. I think partly TSR2, had it, had, it, had it run its course, would suddenly have become a strategic white elephant because NATO changed its, strate its strategy in 67, 68 to emphasise a conventional pause before nuclear weapon, weapons use. Uh, and lo and behold, suddenly the one thing that Healy, as Ministry of Defence, had been had saved reluctantly and was continually carping about the P1127 Harrier suddenly became suddenly became uh, the bee's knees of uh, of, Labour, of of Healy of Healy's contribution to to NATO flexible response. So you know, you, you, three years have made a big difference in that. Would have made a big difference in that respect. Which is where I perhaps offend Derby. I think to some extent, um, if I'd been a spad to the Labour government, I would have said, stand up to the buggers, rather more than the Labour government did during 64, 67. And I think by and large, the, the one thing that wasn't driven home from Plowden was the merger of Hawker Siddeley and BA, BAC to have created a single solid, strong airframe company to at least politically have balanced Rolls-Royce and its interests coming out of Derby following the merger with British BSE. But that's a strategic question. That's a long way away from the TSR2 decision, which I think really was a very good choice. Anybody else? Uh, thank you. Um, if I had been an advisor at the time, I'd have probably gone along the lines of smash it together with Europe. You, that that collaborative inevitability of working with European partners to try and stand up to the US aviation industry was it was just a matter of time before it was happening. Um, personally, with the TSR two, uh, I mean, contrary to the talk I gave earlier, um, it was an inevitability that that had to happen. Really, and a Labour government at the time would have been wise to push that agenda for, for the for further forward quicker. Um, as opposed to just going along with the Jaguar. But be it at the time, you have got the French being the French um, and saying no at every opportunity to the Brits, really. So working with European partners would have been the way forward, in my opinion. Yes, yeah, so um, <clears throat> I would say the decision to cancel TSR2 at the time, I think, was the correct decision. And I also think that a Conservative government uh, would have made the same decision in the same time frame. Uh, or you know, perhaps a couple of years later, but I, I think it wasn't long for the world and it shouldn't have been. Um, I think the shift towards flexible response kind of really necessitated an aircraft like the Tornado. Um, the Tornado was really designed in that framework and really kind of the pause for Britain in um, generated by TSR2's collapse gave the nation kind of some breathing room to design and specify an aircraft that fit that flexible response strategy. Of course, we know when the, to when the tornado was eventually used in service in kind of its most um, significant capacity in the first Gulf War, those uh, design philosophies which had come from flexible response, that low level overland penetration led to high attrition rates in, in the first Gulf War because they were you know, thinking we'd be fighting against uh, surface-to-air missiles, and really it was walls of tracer and flak fire. So it's, it's always very difficult to say what the right decision would have been, but I think in that moment, I think cancelling the TSI-2 and then seeing the opportunity that presented itself with MRA-75, it was the right decision. The MRA-75, like I said in my talk, it started as a non non-British consortium. It started really as NKF with the Germans and then the countries that came together. So in a lot of ways, Britain jumped on an opportunity when it saw it. And I think it was the right decision. In a lot of ways, I think it was the only way for it to meet its needs for the 1970s onwards. I, I honestly don't see what the RAF would have had had they not had the tornado. Uh, what should have happened? Uh, I think um, we'd have to go back to a, a period much earlier than the um, development of TSR2, particularly its cancellation. What should have happened was that the UK really needed a very long-term strategy for combat aircraft development, looking over several decades ahead, to have avoided the stop-go, stop-go approach that tended to occur, and certainly avoided the tendency to try skipping a generation, and usually uh, coming unstuck as a result. 
you can't skip a generation in aircraft development because you have not developed the uh, experience required in order to move from one generation to the next. Uh, what should have happened is that maybe, uh, as I think I mentioned, an 80% capable TSR2 uh, would have had some viability in terms of reasonable development time, reasonable development cost, and reasonable unit and uh, operational cost. Uh, we should also have uh, considered the further development of existing aircraft, certainly the Hunter, I think, uh, was underdeveloped, and given the requirement for a close air support aircraft, it perhaps had some greater life. The notion of TSR2 actually acting in the uh, tactical sense in terms of close air support is absurd. There is a diagram showing its uh, external stores fits, which includes uh, snare rocket pods. Um, insane, the thought of an aircraft of that size and lack of manoeuvrability operating over the front line. Whoever thought of that is certifiable. Uh, it didn't happen that way. Uh, however, um, you know, history is not just what happens, it's what happened in the context of what else could have happened. It could have been a successful programme had we been less ambitious. Uh, there's been this long desire, I think, for the RAF to be some sort of um, United States Air Force Tribute Act, a sort of U a USAF mini-me, that we're is always going to be as good as they are, and it will just be British uh, pluck and ingenuity that wins through. The thing is, we don't have anything like the resource, and we need to be much more focused on how we actually apply the limited resource we have. You take the example of Sweden, that since the Second World War has been exemplary in the sense of having a long-term strategy in combat aircraft development, in actually being focused on what is required and remaining in a coherent, consistent, and also realistic approach to developing those aircraft, uh, the, the Tunnen, the Lansen, the uh, Draken, Viggen, and now Gripen. Sweden has got a population the size of London. How on earth have they done that? Because they have actually been realistic. That's what should have happened. We should have been realistic. Because I've just had a ping, memory ping. Um, in 1963, the, the British and the French government were having a, a, a good, solid conversation about potential collaborative programmes. Um, the Brits hadn't fallen in uh, with and bought the, 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 the Breguet Atlantique, and much of the French moaning about that and we'd gone on ahead and produced the Nimrod um, a, a Nimrod um, a, um, Nimrod um, ASW on our own but there was a, there was a beginnings of a oh we can't really afford all of this kit so the, the Julian Amory was was that was the British protagonist having a chat with his French opposite number about possible collaborations in in 63 and TSR2 did enter the get into the agenda so did the P1154 as well which was possibly the, the better option because that was um, that was paper, still a paper aeroplane as opposed to the metal that was a, a emerging um, on, on the TSR2. But of course, the, the, the French had no interest whatsoever in either the, the 21 or the, the 54 or TSR2, be, precisely because it was already, they were already ongoing projects. They were in being, effectively, as far as the, the British were concerned, and the French would have been supernumeraries. So in a sense... The cancellation of the TSR-2 then made room, and the, and the, and the P-1154, made room for more serious conversations between the French and the British about a military aircraft package, Jaguar and the AFAG. Uh, and that in itself is a complex story. But nonetheless, the, the, you can see that the, the TSR-2 was on the... In a sense, that would have got in the way of a, of, of a European collaborative programme. Um, it moot whether the French, in the end, would have been responsive um, to um, that level of cooperation because they bailed out of the AFVG precisely because they had a better domestic op domestic option, and that's the more interesting comparison. Where the French went, down, the route the French went down in the 1960s, as opposed to the Swiss. I totally agree with you, Paul. But the French commitment to a strategic core of independence was a very decisive di strategic view of, of of the aircraft industry. Yeah, you mentioned France, so I'm going to jump in here. Um, so they, uh, at the time of AFVG, the British government wasn't entirely surprised at all that the French pulled out of the program. Uh, privately, um, Pierre Mesmer, uh, Minister of Armies in France, had actually essentially said um, within his own government that France had no interest in um, kind of long-range strike capabilities in the future. They saw it uh, as kind of dead in the water. 
Uh, and this is kind of interesting because that's a shift. That's, a, you know, completely opposite to how Britain was viewing its role and its position in Europe. And a lot of that's because France didn't see itself as having a responsibility for NATO, whereas obviously the tornado informed the kind of the backbone of Britain's responsibility and its station in Germany as such. Um, but interestingly as well, the French um, floated interest in the tornado at several points, but they were never really interested. Uh, just thought I'd put that out there. Well, the French did have the uh, Mirage 4 and then the uh, Mirage 2000N uh, for the strike roll. Uh, one quick point I'll make uh, before looking for another question is in terms of realism, the P1154, if the uh, supersonic capability had been dropped, but the, uh, the Stovall requirement uh, retained in a ground attack role, I think it would have been a much more useful aircraft than the original Harrier. Anyway, um, so. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, it's not a question. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for your excellent presentations. And you have cleared up a lot of misconceptions that I had and urban myths, if needs be, on the TSR2. I've got to admit, I'd be openly would admit that I viewed the TSR2 with rose-tinted glasses. <laughs> but your presentations have thrown a, a more balanced view on that, and I wish to thank you for that. Thank you. Does anyone want to make a response to the gentleman's comment? No, it's your, it's your show. No, it's our show. Um, is there any evidence or has anybody come across any exchange of ideas between the UK and Canada, and specifically between TSR2 and the Avro Arrow, or any sign that lessons were being thought about because they were busy creating and then scrapping an aircraft for a possibly for a unique local role? Uh, yeah, there is an interesting um, parallel between the two cases, and it's uh, notable how controversial the Arrows cancellation remains in Canada. Uh, any any thoughts, Keith? Uh, only briefly, because all these little, you know suddenly, suddenly have you know little wave for the dusty archive in my brain. Um, but in, 50, in 1958, when the OR339 was was beginning to be put together, uh, there was a, a very Long, I call it the pre Plowden Plowden because it was a big internal report on the state of the British aircraft industry. Um, it never published, but it was it, it was subject to a great deal of inter interdepartmental conversation and negotiation in 1958. And during the course of its deliberations, they did look at alternatives. Uh, purchases, including looking at uh, what was emerging in France, but particularly they did references were made to the to 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 the acquisition of the Avro Arrow. Um, partly because there, I think there were some British links between it. I know certainly Avro Canada had had links to Hawker Siddeley over here. Yeah, Say again? Yeah, yeah. So, that, so you could have said it would have been an Anglo-Canadian program. I've even, and I tell you, Paul, I've even got a scratch in the back of my mind that the same negotiations, the same references were made to acquiring a B fifty eight Hustler, at least as, no, as a possibility. Yeah, come on. I think the potential acquisition of the B-58 Oslo was at least um, briefly considered, but given the extreme cost of that aircraft, I, d I don't know if it ever really received serious consideration. I think in the end, it would, they, these, were just, these were just paper considerations that, that, that Ministry of Supply, um, um, MOD, and certainly tre Treasury officials on, the, on this particular committee were looking at. They were, they were just speculative um, considerations. But yeah, the, the, the Avro Arrow did flash across Whitehall's consciousness, albeit a little briefly. There is actually a file on the Avro Arrow for the RAF at Q complete file. Um, just to mention B-58, um, the old specification system that was dumped in 1950 in the UK was first specification 1943, BB-143, whatever it might be. And then it was uh, 100 serious specifications. But in, I'm sure I've read some documents for TSR-2 or OR-339 where they actually called it B-58 because it was bomber from 1958. I might be wrong, but that's a cell that's woken up in here. But the Arrow was a long-range interceptor. 
And in 1954-55, we had a requirement, F155T, OR329, I think it was, for a long-range interceptor, which was won by the Ferry Delta III. That went with the 1957 white paper. And the Americans had a huge requirement for a long-range interceptor, which would have been met by the North American F-108 Rapier, and that was dumped because of um, costs and the size of it. Um, so it was a different programme, entirely different programme to TSR-2, but in fact it followed the same path. Quite, And it's I can imagine there's a conference like this goes on in Canada occasionally mm. on the Arrow. I'm sure there is, because it is so controversial. So it's a gorgeous aeroplane as well, so that doesn't help. Mike. Thank you, Tony. Tony's just reminded me of another thing I wasn't looking for but stumbled across in the archive. Um, the Gloucester Javelin, there was meant to be a thin wing Javelin, which oddly had a fatter wing. <coughs> the inner wing was fatter than the outer panels, the average was thin. But when they were looking at that, Gloucester's were designing early uh, designs for what became TSR2 and offering that. At the same time, the Ministry were looking at the Avro Arrow, and I don't recall them ever thinking, well, maybe we could use the Avro Arrow as a bomber. Um, so that's the interesting thing that what they were looking at it, but not for the job. Um, and they were talking about Hawker Sidley, I think, building it potentially in the UK. I think with Gyron engines or Olympus or something, uh, a UK engine. So um, they did look at it, and they didn't think that'll meet the job that we we're putting together here. No low, low altitude flight in with that massive delta wing. So I think that's probably it. Ping. 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 Because it was probably because Gloucester were making such a pig's ear of the thin wing javelin. I, that, it was way beyond schedule. I, that, that's, that's the clue. I think that's why the, that's why the arrow <laughs> slipped into the conversations. Yeah, yeah it was a, nothing to do with the TSR too, but you're right, it's a, a similar sort of a, what looked like a very promising aeroplane was, was in the end stuffed by the inadequacy of the market and the ability of government to pay for it. In, in terms of the uh, potential of the uh, thin wing uh, javelin, I... I have very little uh, uh, hope and uh, confidence in such a project. I don't think the Javelin was a, a good place to start. I think it went through something like seven marks trying to make it at least adequate. Uh, uh, well, maybe, maybe not, but that's not exactly a high bar. Uh, the, um, the, the, going back to the B-58 point um, prompts an interesting uh, issue in the, uh, that f apparent focus on the desirability or indeed the view that uh, supersonic performance Mark II performance was uh, an absolute requirement without which um, there was no point in having an aircraft at all, hence the RAF's uh, disregard of the Buccaneer. Uh, but I've read, and this was a comment apparently by one of the F-16 designers, uh, that the, the B-58 Hustler fleet uh, numbered about uh, 100 aircraft uh, at any one time active. And study of this bomber that was capable of cruising at Mark II they found that the air airframe with the greatest number, the greatest time of supersonic flight had flown supersonic for seven hours, and the total supersonic time for that fleet was 200 hours. And you compare that to, say, the time that the Concorde fleet, British Airways and Air France, much, much smaller, cruising at Mark II, but for a supersonic bomber, it apparently was of so little value that it was very, very rarely used. Question. Can I ask Keith a question? I've actually asked him in private today. Why not make it all public? Why not record this in private? In my talk earlier, I, I stressed a bit about the Hawker Sidley alternative. The idea of that was to see whether, if Hawker Sidley had been a better manufacturer, if it had been flying, say, by 1963, better airframe, that much further ahead would have survived. And I asked Keith earlier what was Hawker Siddeley like as a, as a manufacturing company? You know, and a, did, they, did Avro and Hawker work together well? Would you mind following that up again? Uh, I, the Hawker Group at this time was a very strange organisation. I, I mentioned in my talk this morning about the, you know, the, the, the Vickers and de Havilland were almost the perfect model of companies that the Ministry of Supply in 56, 57 were looking at as the core of a, of a more rational um, organised um, aerospace industry. On the face of it, Hawker Sidley Group should have had the same weight. I mean, it had um, non-aerospace interests, it had the diversified um, uh, manufacturing concerns, but it had this strange, almost, was it five, six 
design teams? I can't remember the number, the total. All of whom could compete or are allowed to compete by the Hawker, manage, Hawker Group management for the same MOD contracts. You saw that, you know, that was you know, quite positively balmy. I mean, of the, I mean, of the Hawker Group, I suppose one or two of them were stronger than others. Kingston clearly was was out, was outstanding as a as, as a design as a design centre. Avro on the same by the same token, uh, and it. I suspect it would have made sense for a, a you know, for a, hawk, a better, stronger Hawker management to push Chatterton um, uh, and Kingston closer together. But in a, that's, a, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's even worse than you think that when, when Wharton and Weybridge were trying to come together, the thought that you'd have to pummel heads at, at, at Avro and, uh, and Hawker to get a common design, a coherent management team would have, would have begged a description. So, I, so the, yes, you, it's still a bit of a... I'll have to get to the bottom of Hawker Group, I think, over, over the next few years. But I, I think, by and large, they were ruled out because of the incoherence of, of, of the central management. And the, the MOS was just looking at English Electric and Vickers. They were, that was going to be the core of the industry. I think, and, and just in passing, they would have, they, they also would, lo would have loved De Havilland to have gone in with them as well, which is a very different story for what, what you know, what might have been. Yeah, I, I pinged his head, he's pinged mine. Um, after the Avro Arrow was cancelled, some of the Arrow designers went to work at Kingston in what's called the Advanced Projects Group, which was meant to do all the fancy pants future gazing. Um, and I, it added another design team on one site. And certainly, just to give an idea of the tribal nature of Hawker, the people in Hawker Design Office who went to work in the Advanced Projects Group, either upstairs or in the building next door, were seen as they're not part of us anymore. They've gone to the, the dark side. And John Fozard actually was, and he was alienated when he came back for a while. Yeah. So, um, again, you need to understand what's inside the heads of these people in the past. They were very tribal, but that's because they worked together and understood each other and often could do things without having to explain things. Whereas when you bring teams together, why are you doing it like that, Fred? Well, we've always done it like that around here. Oh, we're back at that one, are we? But actually, the reason we'd always done it like that is because we had this debate 20 years ago. And uh, so I think... Hawker look odd in retrospect, but at the time they're probably more normal than this sort of scientific design that was going on at Wharton. I know a, a panel question for. I've got my I've a name, name aphasia. Mike. Mike. So, oh, geez. Um, that we've. We, Wharton, I use Wharton, or British Aerospace has now developed what we, we could say 40 years of, of collaborative experience from, you know, moving from 58 through to now. It's a, it's, a, it's a long time, it's 60 odd years. And they're putting together a package of collaborative activities involving little bits of the old Typhoon group and the Japanese. But the French and the Germans are having trouble working together. In part, I suspect, is that Dassault has never learned to collaborate correctly. Whereas we have had this experience of pain, agony, sometimes crisis, but I've learnt the psychology of collaboration. I don't know what you think about that, Mike. I think Wharton were always happy to collaborate. And going into their early history, um, some of the stuff I've dug up around the influence of German designs on the lightning, for example, um, they learnt from that, but equally they brought in knowledge from outside to add to theirs. So I think because they're a young team, the way it's always been explained to me is they were a young team who were doing new things and therefore they were more outward looking rather than others who were kind of like, no, we built the SOP with this or the, the, the Gloucester that, so we know what we're doing already. So perhaps they were more open-minded and as a result of that willing to work with others. At the same time, I myself have worked with some very awkward people at Wharton. So I think the idea of organisational culture doesn't necessarily embed, but certainly the UK government has seen the benefits of collaboration. And um, when we did the combat air strategy, one of the first things I was told isn't really up for debate is it's international by design because we just collaborate from the get-go. And I don't think um, Dasso start from that position. So I'm not sure to what extent is Wharton is happy to work with the government policy or the government policy reflects Wharton's capabilities, a bit of both. Um, but certainly the UK has seen collaboration as something that works and the French have yet to have that experience really. Yeah, just building on that in the example of the French, um, around the time that the um, kind of the Netherlands, Britain, Italy and West Germany were coming together, 
on the uh, tor- on the tornado when it was MRCA and before that MRA seventy five, the French were looking for collaborative partner- partners to work on their Mirage three G, an aircraft that would be later cancelled. That was similar in a lot of ways uh, to the tornado. Uh, the problem was is that f- what France wanted essentially was uh, pilot arrangements. And this is basically the nature of the majority of their collaborative uh, agreements. France would be in control. France would be the design center. France would make the decisions. And you'd get a nice industrial share. Uh, that's not what the tornado was from the very start. Um, what the tornado promised was to give all the partners uh, a share in the design work equal to the amount of aircraft that they would agree to purchase. Uh, and so I think Wharton, f- certainly, and Britain, Italy, and Germany, and all the companies, I think they learned very quickly that, you know, this true collaboration was a case of um, really sharing in all aspects of design. Um, pilot arrangements work, they're great, but if you've never done a true collaborative um, program before, and you're used to having control, I think that could be quite disorienting for uh, Dasso. Thanks. I think um, further collaboration with the French uh, could have been uh, possible and potentially very beneficial. Uh, they worked together on Jaguar. Um, that seems to have been very successful, as uh, Mike Kerr made clear. Uh, a spay-powered version of the Mirage 4 was proposed as a possible TSR2 um, alternative, and I think there was great potential in that aircraft with um, the engines being built in Britain and at least some of the airframe, whether we'd have accepted what was a, essentially a French aircraft as a collabor- rather than a pure collaborative av- aircraft is another matter. Are there any more questions? Or I'm um, happy for people simply to state an opinion uh, as opposed to asking a question. You can always state your opinion and just ask at the end, do you agree with me? Um, the, this is fairly typical behavior of senior RAF officers at Q&A sessions. They don't actually have questions, they just have opinions and then seek uh, confirmation. The gentleman in the front row. Um, yes, um, thank you all again for the presentations. Uh, Mike in particular was uh, interesting hearing stuff from Ivan because I spoke to him a fair bit. Um, he told me that the TSR2 project was a really good, long, expensive training course in how to build a Jaguar. Uh, uh, and, and that working with Weybridge was very good training for working with the French. So... Um, uh, it's a story with a lot of villains, um, lots of them unfairly blamed for various things. Uh, I think it's the only project that's been undermined by the Russians and the Americans, for instance. Um, and I was wondering, which are the favourite villains of each of the panel and why? Yes, I'll go for that because I just had another ping as we go in because one of the sort of set of actors we've we've we skirted around a bit over this is actually the bureaucrats that were running the program. I mean, I, I, the bits in some of my my presentation I realise I missed out that the the co- I said the common enemy that that, that that Wharton and Weybridge certainly Freddie Page and and his and his um, sorry based colleagues realised that they were up against. Um, were the problems coming out of the ministries, the eight, particularly, well, the air, particularly the air ministry, because they were leading the spec, they were leading the specification, the requirement change, the rest of it. MOS was was more concerned about getting the the industrial strategy sorted. Uh, one of the paradoxes of this is, and I have to go back to the an earlier procurement disaster, which was the Swift. And one of the features of this was the the the, the, the government came or, or the MOS was looking at this. What went what went wrong? And at the time, they were looking across, as often Whitehall did, was to look across the Atlantic. Healy would do the same later. And how are they how are they controlling their programs? And the Americans had come up with two linked concepts: the weapon systems idea, rather than sort of. The, the government would buy an engine, buy a, buy a radar, and buy an airframe, and you know shove that together. You had to think about systems integration, and get one person, one designer would take a look at the whole system. The Lightning, I think, was the first example, wasn't it, Mike? And TSR two was going to be a, another example of weapon 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 systems design, as opposed to just putting a lot a bunch of equipment inside a, inside an aluminium can. But one other concept that was coming out of the United States and was very much central to um, DOD thinking at the time, was the notion of the prime contractor. That if you had a systems approach to 
procurement, it followed you had to put the industrial management team right front and centre of the whole programme and let them, to some extent, get on with it, with monitoring to ensure that they were doing it efficiently, they were spending it right, and money wasn't going into the back pockets of various, um, various clients. But, and this was seen by, in some of the procurement reforms that came after the SWIFT, that we ought to go down this route. Weapon systems, for sure. Prime contractor, ooh, that would mean trusting the companies. And quite frankly, the Ministry of Supply and the Air Ministry did not trust any of the British aircraft companies to manage the TS, a programme as complex as the TSR2. This, in a sense, was chicken and egg. The, the British aircraft companies were, in a sense, let, you know, were, were almost nannied through contracts. Um, they depended, a lot of them depended upon the Farnborough for research and other technical inputs, unlike English Electric, which was generating its own data. So in a sense, there was a notion, yeah, these guys really aren't competent enough to be full responsible for delivering the project as prime contractors. So the ministry instituted a whole complex of committees, oversights, some of which were just enormous, you know, room as big as this, trying to micromanage the programme. And I remember uh, reading in the Freddie Page diaries at this point that very belatedly he was given responsibility for programme control. And this was 1963. Or by then, all the problems, all the damage to the, to the, to the reputation of the programme had already been made. But in that sense, the, the, the missing element from our conversation has been the dead, hand, the dead bureaucratic hand of the procurement system in place at the time. I don't know if you've got a comments on that one, Mike. Mike. Well, trying to think about this. I mean, one thing is uh, all the sort of system stuff and the procurement approaches that came in and project management originated in the States, usually from missile programs, and aircraft programs are very different. Um, when they tried them, the Cook Craigie program in the early 50s and so on, um, they didn't work out so well. And one of the striking things, uh, for my sins in the past, I used to teach project management at a business school, so I apologise to anybody who's ever been on such a course. It's, it's no less pleasant, more pleasant from the other side teaching the things. Um, project management depends on events. We have built the concrete bunker. Now it's time to come and put the chairs in. You know, it's the construction industry, it kind of works. With aviation, what you're trying to do is achieve non-events. It hasn't crashed yet. Um, that's the stuff that matters. It's the knowledge that's built in that process. Because you're trying to do something usually that you haven't done before. If you're doing a new combat aircraft, there'll be some aspects of it that are completely novel. Um, and really, you're finding your way. So I think whoever decided, and there, there, is a, there was a visit to the US in 58, 59, where MO, Ministry of Supply and, uh, and um, RAF officers went to be impressed by Vigilante and Hustler and all the programmatic control. Um, but decided the ministry should have the central prime contractor function still. Um, they appointed a main contractor in the, in the case of Vickers, but they didn't give them the authority and power. Um, so you kind of had this hodgepodge of, we believe we can do it that way, um, but actually we're going to keep some of the old ways as well, because that gives us authority and power. Um, but ultimately, I think for the, the villain piece, and I, I've just been thinking about this, I think actually, I'm going to say Duncan Sands, why not, the tar in Mr. everything. But the, the, the idea that the government should sort of force together industry to, to for, basically we're taking the contracts away from you, so there's not enough work, but we're also going to tell you, what you how you react to that, we're going to control how you react to that. And I think Hawker Sidley's case, um, in, they were looking to move away from a lot of aviation. And, that was it. and that's a fair response, perhaps. Maybe the fact that there are no contracts for aeroplanes means there's no aeroplane industry, rather than try to force one to survive on no contracts or poor contracts or rubbish requirements. Um, so I think perhaps it's the element of industrial policy without any understanding of industry. Um, whoever is behind that is the villain. I don't you blame them. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, two. Yeah, okay. Go on. I blame uh, Aubrey, Aub Aubrey Jones, but I'll come back to that. Uh, just to add on to what was saying about how the Air Ministry and the Ministry of Supply was being in charge, I very much echo that. Uh, and there was a, a beautiful uh, example of that when I was doing my research into this. My, pro my individual project at uni was, was it 57 odd people was in a meeting uh, and they did a head count around the room and said, right, next time we want less people for the next meeting, 62 people turned up for it. It just shows you that the level of bureaucracy and 
lack of willingness, as was said before, to trust in the companies to get along with it, really. But in answer to the question about who I would feel is the sort of villain in the piece, I'd probably have to go and say um, Lord Mountbatten, really, and there was a lot of who's when it was mentioned earlier as well. Very much how he was trying to kneecap the Air Force, um, or just the armed forces in general, really, with um, keeping this uh, inter-service rivalry going, having his um, five models or cards of buccaneers for the price of one TSR2 to try and undersell or, or um, deter potential buyers of the programme as well, such as the Australians. Um, it, it did not help at all, really, when you're trying to politicise and somebody, somebody like that should be very much removed from that process, really. Can we have a quick word from Tony and Sam? I was just going to say, Man Batten as well, actually, to have that. The, the documentaries and films I've seen about, he seems to be an incredibly arrogant person. Whether that is true or not, I don't know. But you're right, to go to Australia and say, it's rubbish, you know, when he's not in a position to do that. Paradoxically, he pushed the buccaneer and the RF with changes of policy and got the buccaneer, and I believe it did rather well. So maybe he was right, but um, I think he overstepped his role considerably. And... Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever done a biography of him, but maybe that should be featuring it if it is. I would just say it's relative. If you're an engineer, it's bureaucrats and politicians. If you're a politician, it's engineers. If you're British, it's American. If you're French, it's British. If you're so, I think it's relative. But Mountbatten, pretty much everyone's enemy, it seems. So, yeah, that'd be my answer. I I won't name a villain specifically. Uh, the point uh, that uh, Ben made about the 57 people being then replaced by 62 people at the next committee meeting, uh, yes, that's not a way to actually run a pro program. Uh, the American aircraft designer, Ed Heinemann, who designed, amongst other things, the um, Douglas A4 Skyhawk, very, very good design indeed. Uh, he said, you don't need a big organization to develop and build an aircraft. You need half a dozen people who know what they're doing. The, there was a gentleman there, who had a question? Thank you. Uh, just a nice, simple question for you. Do you actually like the aircraft as an aircraft? And what are your thoughts? Was it a good aircraft or not? I think it, I think it had potential, uh, but it would uh, that potential would have been f fulfilled at great cost, given the the highly challenging combination of characteristics and performance parameters it was meant to meet. It was just too ambitious. It should have been cancelled either on the drawing board or uh, when they got as far as they did. Continued as a research program, but to have spent so much money and then get nothing from it, that made no sense. But it should really have never got that far. I don't have much to add to that, to be honest. Uh, I also don't really like how it looks. I will say everyone always says it's very aesthetically pleasing. I don't agree. I think it's it's uh, it's a very strange and warped looking thing. But yeah. sorry, everyone. It, it, uh, there's, a, there's a very um, surreal um, continuation of the, the life of the TSR2. Apparently it features in Japanese manga comics. They presumably think it looks suitably futuristic. Um, I'd have to um, go on the contrary and say it is a nice looking aircraft personally the, the, the saying is if it looks right it is right but in the case of the TSO it's probably the one case where it did look right but felt quite short of what it was trying to achieve really or what it wanted to be achieved the great well the, one of the one of the Apollo astronauts, um, um, Borman, who was he became chairman of, of of Eastern Airlines, was was showing his new chief financial officer all all the aircraft at uh, at, the, at the airport, and the the, the new CFO said, Don't, "Mr. Borman, please, as far as I'm concerned, they're depreciating assets." And you know, I take a rather economic view of this thing. This 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 was a, this was a white elephant, whatever it looks like. I mean. And I will now create the greatest heresy of all by saying I'd have exactly the same view about Concorde, which is <laughs> presumed to be one of the finest looking aeroplanes in the world. And it didn't make money, so it failed. Whereas the Constellation looks lovely and did make money. Um, I would say there's still the little boy who 
saw a plane that reminded him of a giraffe when it came out from under linoleum. It's got a very long neck and kind of a small nose, um, but it's very impressive. I mean, just walking in the hangar there, I have been here before, I've seen TSR2 at uh, Duxford as well. It's a very impressive thing. You can understand the emotional response people have, like, look at that. And um, as the sort of last UK-only combat aircraft, if you're going to go out, it's kind of a way of going out with some style in, in a sense, um, it's brought us all here to, today. You know, it, it does have a, a power um, that perhaps it didn't do politically or technically or operationally, but it has something. Um, but I'm just, you know, the, the most impressive thing, as I said, is that TSR2 there is there's a Kestrel behind it because jump jets are the best kind of jets. Um, but they're never attractive. And the TSR2 certainly looks better than most jump jets. Yeah. Yeah, well, I like it too. In fact, I've worn my TSR2 for over 20, TSR2 for over 20 years of lectures. Um, I'm an aviation historian, but essentially I'm an aircraft enthusiast. And I've always liked the pretty aeroplanes. And I actually think TSR2 looks terrific. But you're right. It was the one aircraft that looks right but didn't do very well. But I'll, I've actually said this before. TSR2, Concorde, 57 white paper, all these controversial things. If they didn't happen, as an aviation historian, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> and I have nothing to write about. And uh, it, 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 yeah, it, and uh, I'm going to pinch a thing. Of, you said at a lecture recently, George, if you don't mind, I'm going to copy your idea here. Um, we have this thing about project cancelled, romance about it. it, could have been great. And you said when you did your talk recently, if the Swift had been cancelled right at the start of the Mark I, I suspect people have been writing today, what a disaster it was to cancel the Swift. Well, we know bloody well it was hopeless. So excuse the language. Um, but TSR2, I think, just looks the part. You can't help it, it looks the part. And uh, when you imagine it sort of kitted out with all the weapons and stuff, it must have been pretty impressive. But yes, it was a white elephant, absolutely. Thank you. Are there any more questions or any more opinions? Sir, again. Thanks. You mentioned uh, so saying about obviously today's been about the TSR two, but you talk about the uh, all the other planes that never were, like the uh, Arrow and the P eleven fifty four, and how how that was on a similar way. It was it was too ambitious to to have ever worked. But another one I would I'd interested to get the panel's views on is the uh, HS six eight one transporter. Uh. That was, uh, in its own way, I think, equally ambitious with the, the notion of being able to have that uh, very large uh, airlifter, but operating in a short takeoff and landing capability on rough strips to support such dispersed air operations of aircraft such as TSR2. You know, the two went hand in hand to an extent, and uh, I think they were both equally over ambitious. I have a feeling the HS681 and the P1154 were actually linked projects. I think one was designed to support the other in the field, in the sense this was going to be the the, the aeroplane that would would go up country with the, with a deployed um, dispersed P1154 and start supplying it with munitions and and fuel and all the rest of it and and spares and. And, uh, and the like. I think the 681 as a transport aircraft was probably too small and I think that the, the eventual choice of the, the C-130 was a, was a one really lo wonderful piece of procurement, offshore procurement. Uh, I don't echo that as well. Having worked with a Herc, it is a marvellous aircraft and it's such a shame it's going out of service. Um, best piece of kit the RAF has ever had in my opinion. No bias at all. Just from the top of my head, I think the 681 was expected to be two and a half million a copy when the Hercules was one million at the time. So is it worth the difference? And that was a project cost for the 681, so it probably would have cost more. Um, using jets off rough fields isn't great. Using you know, Lockheed make a big case about propellers versus jets, and I think they may be right. The amount of any, how hard you want that stone to hit you kind of thing it comes into it. Um, but I think at the time it was, there's a great future orientation. The Hercules was seen as old hat. 
they're still building them now. You know, we get to take them out of service. I think New Zealand are, are buying some, or Australia are buying someone. There's one country that they're in production for currently. Um, so it's kind of it's just an eter it's like I don't know Swiss Army life or something, isn't it? It's just an eternal thing. So I think it was probably a good thing ultimately to get, and the amount of money saved made sense. But as with the enthusiast in all of us, it would have been an impressive thing to see a six eight one fly. No, I can't really say. That. Just one final view about this. Um, we really didn't produce transports very well. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking. I'm thinking of Belfast. I mean, Beverly Trundle. The Belfast was re reputed to go, go, you know, go in reverse in a back, in a in a strong headwind. I mean, we we didn't do very well. And it, to some extent, that's the classic issue of a of a type of aeroplane. Our market was simply too small to justify the development cost. Even it, perhaps in some respects, it was a much more interesting case of. Uh, of an aeroplane that was really too specialised for the for the size of the UK market, uh, we would repeat the same problem a little later on with uh, with airborne early warning. Well, given that uh, a grand total of ten Belfasts were built, at goodness knows what unit cost and how many uh, Hercules have been built. I think uh, the figures. Yeah. Well, you rest your you rest your case. Uh, question, gentlemen, uh, yeah. towards the back on the right. Sorry, sir. Can you wait for the microphone? Just for... Going back to the question beforehand about uh, whether it looked right, I think, uh, dare I say it, the Russians, when they build an aeroplane, they don't care what it looks like. If it does the job, and they, do it, they reckon it can do it well, then they'll build it in large numbers, i.e. the MiG-21. It doesn't look nice at all. The MiG-29 doesn't look nice, but they have built in vast numbers. Uh, the only thing I can think of is also, if you go to the, the failed American design, the YA-9, and you look at Frogfoot, the Russian equivalent, they're very, very similar, it's as if the Russians have taken that design, found out what's wrong with it, and they have modified it to their own specification. And it works. Another one that they've done. If we go back and look at the 740, why Boeing built the, the 747 originally, it was for a military transport contract, which was eventually won by the C5A. But if you study it further, and you look at the basic design that Boeing produced, and then you look at AM124, they are very, very similar indeed. And yet the Russians have made AM124 work. The Americans rejected it. Why? You know, uh, as I say, they have obviously a different perspective on aircraft. If it looks right and they think it'll work, they'll go for it. They have done. All right, AM124 is a Ukrainian design, yes, but it was built originally under Russian control. The fact that Ukraine is now at war with Russia is, uh, you know, it's like no, bedfellows falling out, isn't it? There we go. What does the panel think on that one? Uh, I would suggest that the uh, C-17 has certainly been very successful, even uh, whatever merits the uh, 747 might originally have had in that role. But uh, I'll pass the microphone on to my colleagues and see what they think. I'd say that there's been a massive history of the Russians trying to copy Western designs. Um, they've also got a greater appetite to take risk, really, as well. Konkorsky's probably the biggest example to get it back in, get that into the air before Concorde was as well. Uh, and there's quite a few similarities between the two in design, isn't there? Uh, just one of many. And it's the same now with the Chinese as well, with them rolling up their own aircraft, where they're nipping aircraft um, or nicking designs, not just from the Americans, but also from the Russians themselves as well. Uh, one great example is they, I believe they bought one particular aircraft just to completely reverse engineer it and ma manufacture it themselves. I think it was a MiG-29. Uh, MiG they tried to buy one. Even then, they were just trying to take the mickey a bit, but... Yeah, just a complete history of it.
mean, I, I'm, I, I have no clue about the very technical capabilities of, of Russian aircraft. I'm, I'm struck, as I said this morning, between um, the, the, the English electrics approach in, in the in, when it when it entered aircraft design and production was to almost take a, a, a Russian or Soviet approach to a manufacturing. You you had your you had your design bureau, as it were, parked out at Wharton Airport with all the the, the flash youngsters uh, and all the equipment that, that and some speculative and beautiful, inter very interesting technology was coming out of uh, of Wharton during during this period and later. And then you shoved it down to the you know the hairy the you know, the the, hair, the hairy wristed um, gentleman down at the at the Preston production plant who so would turn turn these beautiful wonderful designs into into product that would make money. Uh, it didn't work particularly well for English Electric, as as I explained this morning. Um, and I, I haven't a clue whether it works I, 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 under the old Soviet system. Whether Mikhail Yan had the same problem with the production factories. Out in the out in the Urals that had huge overheads, um, because by and large they would be supporting the whole city that surrounded them uh, a, 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 as a social enterprise. But that's all I can say about uh, uh, Russian prototypes and Russian aircraft. Um, just one quick thing, and I can't access the internet because we're in a bunker. Sukhoi built, I think it was a T6, it was called, which is a prototype of the Fencer, which looked remarkably like the TSR2 in many ways. Um, and decided to make it more like an F-111. So maybe that says something. Yeah, you're, you're right about that, Tom. I, it, I can't really comment on that, except it, just thinking about it, uh, some of the earliest Soviet jet fighters from Alexeyev and Sukhoi looked just like the ME-262. They copied that, I think. I think everybody copies everybody else sometimes. Um, I've looked at unbuilt projects for many years, and you see other designs that look very similar to other countries but at the same time one of the fascinations is when you have a requirement if you've got more than one design team producing design how they can vary that's one of the things that's always fascinated me but I, you raise a good point there definitely and I think in certain cases it's true and Konkorsky was a, a flying disaster area I think in many respects I believe it could not go supersonic without reheat is that right yeah Good artists copy great artists, artists steal, I think was the quote. That someone <laughs> right, gentlemen, thank you very much for your questions. I will have to draw a stance now on the, the Q&A because we then move on to the, the final uh, lecture. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity while they queue up the final presentation and all the speakers together to thank them most sincerely for not only for their presentations, but for their candid and open answers to all your questions. Okay, did any of you hear that? <laughs> okay, let's, give, let's thank them. It would also be appropriate to thank John and Graham for doing all the cockpit tours during the day. And Steve, who's been valiantly managing the, uh, all the audio-visual stuff throughout the day. Well done. <laughs>